Welcome back, everyone, and we are back with another guest interview on our Conversations with Cabral series. So today I'm bringing on none other than my own personal HRV coach. HRV stands for heart rate variability. I'm going to explain to you why it is going to be one of the most important metrics that you can begin to look at and study for yourself. And of course, this can be talked about a lot more in the future. I want you to know all about it right here today with my personal coach, Dr. Jay Wiles. Dr. Jay Wiles is a psychologist who actually works with people in a clinical practice down south of me. And uh, he's going to share a lot of that with you today. And also, I'm going to share personal stories of essentially how I've been doing and faring by trying to increase my heart variability, what seems to work best for me, what you may want to do for you, and in the process, reducing stress, improving overall immunity, improving strength, endurance, all of those great things in life. This was a really fun conversation that we got to have. I love being able to introduce you to some of my coaches and, of course, lots of experts here now going forward on our new Conversations with Cabral series. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurveda healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Dr. Jay Wiles, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here today on Conversations with Cabral. Yeah, man. So good to be here as well. I've been excited about talking about some HRV for a while. Yes, exactly. So that is going to be the topic for the day. We'll go with Jay from, from here on out. And a lot of people don't know this, but I'm, I'm really having a lot of my personal coaches on the show, people that I consider the expert in their space, so that you too can learn about all of the different things that we want to go deeper on as a community. So one of the things that Jay has as a specialty is a PhD in psychology. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And you've used that and kind of gone more towards the health and fitness space field, working with elite athletes, working with executives, obviously everyday people. You're out of South Carolina, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, the upstate of South Carolina. So Greenville, which is kind of like in between Atlanta and Charlotte. And you have a clinic there, is that correct? I do. I do. Yeah, I have a clinic that I operate uh, here. I still actually work for the Department of Veteran Affairs. But so through the VA, uh, but I also have kind of my side business that I run, which is kind of turning into my full time business now, um, at kind of as we speak. So yes, indeed. Yeah, and, and I want to get into the different types of practice that you do have because there is so much that you have going on. But one of the reasons why I was excited to bring you on the show is that one of my big passions right now is being able to improve my overall heart rate variability. And Mm -hmm. we'll have you go into exactly what HRV is, which is heart rate variability, why that matters. But the big reason for me is that I've found that if you improve heart rate variability, it's kind of like setting a big goal. In order to achieve a big goal, you have to do a lot of things well in order to achieve that goal. So you actually get better in so many different areas of life in order to be able to accomplish the big goal. And for me, it's being able to improve heart rate variability. So if you could, since you'll do a much better job than me, if you could explain what heart rate variability is to our community, that would be amazing. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, heart rate variability is a very interesting one because a lot of people see it like on devices, they kind of get an aura ring or they'll have, you know, an Apple watch or some other device that says HRV and they have like no clue what that is. So for a large majority of people, they'll just pass that metric over or, and just not even think twice about it. And some people like try to learn about it, but they just can't wrap their heads around it. And so I'm going to put it in its most simplistic form and then break it off. But even in its most simplistic form for people (laughs) may sound a little bit confusing, but basically heart rate variability, it refers to the beat to beat variation in the time intervals between heart contractions. And yes, that is its most in simplistic form, what heart rate variability is, but let me break it apart in a very easy to understand fashion. So when we think about the heart, the heart does not operate like a metronome. It does not want to pace itself to a standard. And the reason it doesn't want to pace itself to a standard is because we have trillions and that's trillions of operations 
conversations that are occurring in the body at every second. And so the heart needs to be able to keep up with it. It needs to be resilient to everything that's thrown at it um, from a physiological perspective. So we tend to see a heart that is healthy and a nervous system that is healthy as one that is quite resilient and adaptable to all the change that it's experiencing. And so the variation between heartbeats, so from heartbeat to heartbeat, we term that in time in time um, as milliseconds. And we don't see kind of the heart operating at this kind of just standard pace. We see it fluctuating up and down and left and right and forwards and backwards. And that variation um, and the deviation of that variation is what we refer to as heart rate variability. So again, that's its in its most simplistic form is that the heart doesn't operate like a metronome. It kind of goes crazy, which is a little bit counterintuitive to what people think about. They think, oh, the heart just kind of would naturally pace itself, right? It would find rhythm. And no, the rhythm is actually chaos. We need it to be chaotic, not a rhythmic. And I can talk about the differences there, but we need it to be somewhat chaotic and an effort to keep up with everything that's going on in the body. It was a great explanation and, and it does get sciency in there, but we need that. We need that part of it. Mm-hmm. I think people will start to recall, especially since one of the big topics that I like to talk about is the nervous system, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, all of which affect the autonomic nervous system, which is mm-hmm. fight or flight, or the rest and relax, or sympathetic nervous system, or parasympathetic nervous system. So one of the things I heard you say is that it affects the nervous system, or more so, I would say your nervous system affects your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So if you're improving your heart rate variability, well, you're most likely doing so by moving out of fight or flight, at least for a period of time. So we'll have you go into that. I'd like to touch on that a bit. But also, one of the big things that we talk about with heart rate variability is that it's not static. And so it's not like you're looking to keep it exactly the same throughout the day. We'll talk just a little bit later in the show, exercise affects it, how sleep Mm -hmm. affects it, how cold affects it, like all these different things, which I find really fascinating. And for me, this is, this is absolutely the number one thing I'm working on right now. So Mm -hmm. give us a little bit more of a tie-in to the nervous system and stress, how stress would affect this. And then let's kind of transition that into the benefits of improving heart rate variability. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about the nervous system and we think about more specifically the autonomic nervous system, so it was kind of previously thought that the autonomic nervous system was autonomic. It was automatic. It was outside of conscious control. We might could be aware of it, but self-regulation or conscious control. And even there are still small pockets of individual who believe that it is truly autonomic, but we have so much research to disregard any of those ideas and opinions that I kind of just push those to the side, honestly. But, you know, I'm open-minded. Uh, but when we, when we think about the autonomic nervous system and, and our ability to regulate it, it wasn't until probably the past 60 to 70 years that we had really good insight into our ability to regulate it until we came across the connection of heart rate variability and the nervous system. And what's great about heart rate variability is, is as it stands right now, it is the least expensive and most non-invasive way of testing or giving insight as it like a window into our nervous system functioning and operation. And so we know that actually as we modulate our nervous system, it is represented in HRV. So as we make changes in the autonomic nervous system to, let's say, either balance out kind of the parasympathetic and sympathetic response or maybe engage the sympathetic response and suppress the parasympathetic or vice versa, because it's good to be able to control it in whatever way we need it, we can actually see those measurable, quantifiable changes in terms of HRV. So the best way to think about it is is that HRV is like a little window, if not a big window, and provides us insight into nervous system functioning. And to answer your question in regards to stress, so when we think about stress, stress is like a taxation on our nervous system. And so we know that our nervous system from birth, typically, unless we've experienced some type of trauma, is very, very resilient. So it's able to bounce back and take on internal and external stressors without much problem. But over time, when we're kind of taxed by stress, whether it's financial stress, work-related stress, relational stress, exercise, or physical stress, these things tax our nervous system. And what that means is it breaks it down. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is, is that if it doesn't rebuild back stronger, then we can have a cascade of different physiological and psychological problems that can happen. And so in general, where heart rate variability comes into play is that if we see somebody who has, if they have a suppressed level of heart rate variability, 
variability, or we see that from their baseline, they're kind of sinking on heart rate variability, then we can have a little bit more of an insight from a quantifiable standard of whether or not they're experiencing some systemic or maybe even acute and transient stress. Without a doubt. And I can tell you for sure, and I wish I had the data from back then, that when I had Addison's disease, and I don't think you need to have Addison's disease in order to go this low, I'm sure I was in single digit HRV. And we'll explain kind mm-hmm. of the, the metrics in just a moment. But I'll tell you that I could not play a game of pickup basketball in college uh, because I had Addison's disease essentially mm-hmm. starting at 17 years old, wasn't diagnosed till 19 years old. And if I played a single game of basketball, 20 minutes, I would have flu-like symptoms the next day. I would be completely sick. My body was not resilient to any type of stress. So Mm -hmm. if I would go out till four in the morning with friends, just having a good time, I would pay for it for the next two weeks. So at that point, I had a very low resistance to life stress or stress overall. And because of that, I ended up sick all the time. My immune system was constantly in disarray. And I would end up with some type of cough, cold, sinus congestion, pneumonia, bronchitis every two weeks, especially during the winter months. And now, and you shared with me this as well with me, and we'll get into this, that HRV actually dips in the colder winter-based months, which is really interesting. So I look mm-hmm. at that, I'm like, I only had three or four good months a year from essentially June through September or early October in New England. And uh, right. now kind of to see why too, vitamin D and be more active and being warm, all of those things do matter. So I would love, well, well let's go into, because I want people to really understand, we're not talking at a high level, we're not talking just science-based, and it's only going to help a few individuals. Heart rate variability is a huge predictor with longevity, or at least mm-hmm. resistance to stress. So let's talk about who heart rate variability would best help. And let's also tune into some of the psychology as well, like with anxiety, nervousness, panic disorders. And then we'll go into what the numbers should be in an ideal world. And then I'll talk about how poor mine are or were and how (laughs) I'm improving them now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the, we'll we'll start kind of like what you were saying in regards to who is HRV made for? And kind of the short answer, and again, I'm biased, is that it's made for everybody. But if you look at these kind of top-notch consumer wearables, things like Aura Ring, Apple Watch, Whoop Band, BioStrap, all of these have heart rate variability built into it as a metric, and they would not kind of spend their time on R&D money and all this research money to put in a metric that wasn't worth people's time. And so I would say that don't just kind of see a metric that's put into one of these wearables that's actually testing and quantifying as kind of just a thing that we push to the side. They obviously want us to see this for a reason. And so HRV measurement is is made for everyone and it serves different purposes, whether it's from a sports performance and recovery standpoint, whether it's from an executive or kind of work performance perspective, or like you mentioned, an anxiety, depression, PTSD, mental health perspective. And obviously that's where my background is. That's kind of what my passion is. And that's what drove me to this field of heart rate variability and the field of applied psychophysiology, which is a long word for biofeedback, which I'm sure we'll get into. But heart rate variability, again, is a great window into our physiological response. And here's what I love about it, is that you can ask somebody subjectively, like, are you feeling stressed? And we'll take that as kind of an example. And I could say, on a scale of zero to 10, how stressed are you feeling? Zero being not whatsoever, it's the best day in the world for you. And 10 is like, you're about to have a panic attack, and you need to go to the ED. And people can, you know, quantify it that way way subjectively. However, I can actually get objective data of your stress response and your nervous system functioning by looking at heart rate variability. And this goes for anyone. This goes for someone, again, who might come in with mental health concerns or for the athlete who's looking at using kind of heart rate variability and looking at their nervous system taxation on recovery and performance and preventing injury. So this metric is so diverse and usable. And I think that's where a lot of confusion comes in is because people don't realize kind of how diverse this metric is and how nuanced it is because, you know, it would take me, you know, hours among hours, if not a whole collegiate class to really dive into the kind of the algorithms and metrics that are used for HRV. But it is a very, very intricate world that we're talking about. But the great thing is, is that we can actually use it on a very simplistic, uh, on very simplistic terms, and we can modulate HRV on very simplistic terms as well. It's just a matter of kind of knowing what you're doing and knowing what you're reading. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, there are so many devices right now that will allow people to look at their heart rate variability. I think some are good, some not so good, but what they are doing is at least 
giving you a broad picture, are you doing better over time or getting a little bit worse over time, or at least in these three or four days? Because those are predictors, as you just said. Mm -hmm. If your heart rate variability is starting to go down over a couple of days, it's a good indicator that your body needs more rest. So if you've been training hard, you're going to want to take a little bit more time off. Your workout time will actually spend doing maybe some lighter work, some aerobic right. work, which we'll talk about, or some sauna, some cold therapy, massage. It'll be more recovery rather than training. So mm -hmm. these are great things that we should explore. So let's talk about, first of all, what does the testing look like? And then where should our numbers be uh, you know, for an average individual? And then also, where should we get to? Is higher better? Is it always better? What does that exactly mean? Yeah, great, great question. So one of the first things you need to do is that if you have a device that is measuring HRV, you need to know what it is measuring. Because say, for instance, I'm going to give the example of the Apple Watch versus the Aura Ring. The Apple Watch and the Aura Ring both measure HRV, but they measure entirely separate metrics. You may put on an Apple Watch and your HRV is at 120, and you put on your Aura Ring and your HRV is at a 30. It can be that big of a difference. And that's because they're looking at entirely different metrics. Now, this is going to get way too complicated, so I'll keep it simple. For instance, the, app, the Apple Watch is looking at something called SDNN or standard deviation of normal beat intervals, which is a, an algorithm. And then the other one, which is the Aura Ring is using RMSSD, which is another algorithm that I typically prefer. And so what, that's why I actually use the Aura Ring and the devices that I train with and have my clientele train with actually utilize the RMSSD metric. Now, here's kind of the crazy thing when we come to norms, because a lot of people, you know, some people are like, you know, throw norms out the window. We don't need norms. It's just self comparison and I don't like that idea and I don't like the idea of just throughout self comparison only based on norms I think there's a happy and a medium uh, a middle ground here and that's where we do utilize self comparison but we also look at normative comparison however if I'm a, if I spit out the numbers that I'm about to spit out if they do not fit within kind of your age range um, and your kind of your normative sample, don't worry about it. And we're going to talk about ways to modulate that. You can do it. You can train the nervous system and you can train up HRV. So for instance, when we're looking at like young, it's typically kind of works in this way that the younger you are, the higher HRV is typically. So as you age, HRV goes down and that's for um, numerous reasons. Um, a lot of it is typically because as people get older, their inflammation gets higher and so HRV goes down because we see kind of the nervous system being more taxed and then with time comes more stressors as well. So if you're looking at kind of like younger age ranges, like say 25 to 34, then we've actually found that the average RMSSD score, that's the only score I'm going to give, I'm not going to give SDNN, is around 39.7. So for, for if you're kind of looking at your aura ring, if you're 25 to 34, you can kind of measure it that way. And, and it, it does vary by men and women a little bit, but I'm only going to provide one kind of normative score, not kind of separate men and women. Typically women do have higher HRV scores. If you're looking at kind of the next age range, so if we're talking about um, 35 to 44, then RMSSD is right at 32. So that's actually where a lot of people that I see are kind of around that 35 to 44 range. From 45 to 54, the RMSSD average is 23. So you can see we're progressively going down uh, with age. Uh, when we look at an RMSSD from the 55 to 64 age range, that RMSSD is right at 21.4. I'm again, still going down. And then I'll give the last age range that I have here from, and this is, comes from a large meta-analysis study, uh, which is 65 to 74. Um, the RMSSD is 19.1. So that should give you kind of a good idea of where you are from a normative population. But just because you might not fall kind of within that range does not mean that all is lost and you, and, and you should be nervous about your HRV. Uh, what it actually means is, is that you have something to either shoot for or you can say, you know what, I'm actually doing pretty well in this, in this area. What I will say is that, and I've told you this uh, before, Stephen, is that the baseline score is not nearly as important as you being able to modulate your HRV. So I'd love to dive into that. And we'll get into that, I'm sure, when we talk about biofeedback, because for people with, you know, an HRV that is is really high, if they can't modulate it, I am actually more concerned with them than I am with someone who has a lower HRV, but can modulate it really high or really low if they need it to. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was great. <clears throat> that actually, so just for everyone listening right now too, and I'm sure we'll send you over to Jay's website towards the end of the show. Anybody who wants a really advanced, this might sound advanced, right? This may sound very advanced to many people, but 
Jay, I mean, really is the expert in this field. And the podcast that he did, it was a solo podcast on Ben Greenfield's show, where he kind of took over and went deep into HRV. We'll also share that with you. So if anybody wants to get super in the weeds on this, for sure, we'll be able to link that up as well. One thing I wanted to share with you, though, is that I look at people like Jay and other people in the biohacking based field and other fields as well. And their heart rates, uh, heart rate variability might be 70, 80, 90, 100, over 100. And you're like, how are they doing that? And so there are actual, so just like everything else, there's genetic factors, but genetics are never your destiny. Uh, if Jay wasn't exercising, if he wasn't doing all these healthy things, well, his would plummet just like anybody else's. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's just components to it. And I've done a lot of research on this now. And I've realized that some ultra mar marathoners have a HRV of 120 and some have 42. So mm -hmm. there's all different, different variations, but I love that you gave the averages because in our community, we don't want to be the average. We want to be better than, but mm -hmm. really important is that there is a huge drop off after 44 years old. I mean, 37 to 32. Okay. You know, I get it, but 32 to 23, it just goes to show that right around your mid forties, the body starts to become quite catabolic. If you are not doing things to care for your body, that is the actual decline of the body right around late 30s, early 40s, and it just starts to drop down from there. And then you kind of plateau somewhere around 60 years old or so where your body's in fully more of a catabolic state. But that is why I do believe that people can reverse aging and they can actually be biologically radically different than their chronology. So I would urge anybody over the age of 45 to actually shoot for the high 30s or mid 40s for an HRV rather than that 23. Look to double it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my goal would be, hey, it, you may or may not do it, but look to double your HRV for your age range. So for me, when I'm 65 plus years old, I'd love to be at a 40, 38, mm -hmm. 40. Maybe it'll happen, maybe not. But the things that you're going to need to do in order to improve your HRV are good for everything all around. So let's talk a little bit about that. One thing I did mm -hmm. want to share, though, is that the way that I started to get more into this is I started to really research a lot more longevity. And longevity will be kind of the next three to five years. I'm going to be talking much more about that you know, in three to five years. That'll be more of a focus. Right now, we've got a lot of work to do to just get people healthy now. And then we'll talk about some real, really more advanced things. But I've been researching a lot of, on, on telomere length. And again, telomeres are only one factor. But if you look at the things that you need to do, to increase your telomere length, they go hand in hand with increasing your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So there's no one factor that's going to improve overall aging. But if you do the things, you're going to improve telomere length, you're going to improve heart rate variability, you're going to reduce inflammation like you just spoke about. So let's start to move this towards, okay, someone, uh, one thing I want to make really clear as well is that I don't recommend using any device other than the ones that Jay's recommending or I'm recommending for heart rate variability because it's going to be too widely variant based on what we're speaking about right now. So Jay, I want you to, I know there's a few that you like, but I'm going to hold it up right here for people watching this on video. I use the leaf device, which is what Jay recommended to me. It's yeah. actually two sticky tabs. It goes right underneath your heart on the left-hand side. And it is the only device that I know that gives you real-time feedback on not just your heart rate. A lot of devices do that, right? You can wear an oximeter. But it gives you real-time feedback on heart rate variability. And this was a game changer mm -hmm. for me. I figured out why my heart rate variability was dropping. And then, of course, I learned how to do biofeedback. Both of those we'll talk about. And the other device I use is the Aura Ring. Neither company sponsors me. I just want to let you know that. But these are the two devices that I use. The Aura Ring is great overnight, but almost useless during the day. But I'm sure that will change mm -hmm. in the future. Like they'll be able mm -hmm. to figure it out in the future. And I don't wear the Leaf overnight because it actually wakes me up when my heart rate variability drops because it buzzes, even though they'll get better at that too. You should be able to turn it <laughs> off right at night. So, you know, there's, no, there's never any one perfect device. But um, heart math, you can work with biofeedback. Mm -hmm. I know Elite HRV you've recommended before. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you take it from here. What would you recommend? And then let's start to talk about some factors that you know of that will begin to increase your heart rate variability. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. You, I, I think that when I always give this talk about heart rate var variability devices, you know, there are so many devices now, pretty much any type of tech wearable is going to have heart rate variability built into it, but that doesn't mean that they're all created equal. And one of the biggest things that I look at, and this is a little bit more nerdy, but I do the work so that you don't have to, is I look at the sampling rate. Um, so sampling rate from an EKG perspective is going to be kind of like the where you set the gold standard for measurement. And so basically, we know that a higher sampling rate is going to give you more accurate data and it's going to give you more robust data, which is why I like utilizing the Leaf Therapeutics device, because if it's high sampling rate, and it's also a wearable EKG. So the Aura Ring, uh, like like I have on as well, which like, like you said, is kind of useless throughout the day, uh, but can give you great data at night. It's sampling rate is is, is rather low compared to the uh, to, compared to the leaf device, which is why you can't get instantaneous feedback from it. Um, and so that's why for the day wear, I always recommend the leaf therapeutics device. The other great thing about the Leaf Therapeutics device is that it does indeed provide you haptic feedback on your HRV throughout the day. And what that looks like is that after the first few days that you wear it, it assesses your baseline HRV. And then what happens is, is that when you dip, your HRV dips into the 20th percentile, it'll actually vibrate on you. And that's a kind of a level of self-awareness. That's a way of kind of conditioning the body and the brain to say, okay, go ahead and take note of what is happening in your environment, what's happening in internally because something has resulted in your HRV dropping. So that's kind of key number one to biofeedback is, is self Is that personalized for you, Jay? I mean, <laughs> does it drop into your 20% or is it 20% of what it, it feels it is? And if so, does it learn about you over a week? Yeah, it draw it and it adjusts. So it's always to you. It is not to kind of a normative um, baseline. It's not to kind of, you know, its own set standards. It uh, assesses your baseline and will continue to modulate your baseline modulate as you modulate your baseline. So if you're doing something to train HRV, like with HRV biofeedback and your baseline's going up, then it will adjust accordingly, which is a really, really cool thing. And when it starts vibrating on you, it actually starts vibrating in a pattern that actually uh, pairs up with what we call res resonance frequency. And resonance frequency is a, is a breathing pattern. And for adult human beings, that's typically anywhere from six and a half breaths down to four and a half breaths per minute. But this device will actually assess your resonant frequency based on kind of the breath pattern, maximizing heart rate variability, and will put you into a specific breathing pattern to help you raise your HRV back up to baseline. And so the great thing about the Leaf Therapeutics device is that with coaching, with maybe someone like me or someone else and with kind of the, the wear of the wear of the device will actually train kind of your HRV modulation as a reflex over time. So basically the more and more you train with the device, the more and more you're going to reflexively engage in nervous system regulation kind of unconsciously and on your own. And that's the whole goal. So yeah, the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, cause it's important to note that in the beginning, I was just kind of, I was almost journaling. I was thinking about, okay, what lowered it? What raises it? And then how can I improve it? So one of the things that always resonates with me is this. It's basically the, the thermostat analogy. Mm -hmm. And I use it for, I mean, I use it for everything. Hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, hypothalamus pituitary ovary, thyroid, all the different eggs of the body. It's like the body has to get used to being in this set zone. So the way that you explain it to me is this, is that every time that haptic feedback, which essentially is just buzzing on your chest. It lets you know, hey, you dropped into your 20th percentile. You say, oh, well, what did I just do that dropped me down? Because what happened is now you're getting your body used to actually being in a lower zone. So you said you really want to try never to allow that to buzz and practice biofeedback so that you get your body used to being at 20 basis points or whatever higher than you were typically you know, used to in the past. So that was a big takeaway. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. what was it that was able to do that? And then you as a coach, so some people are trained with these devices and Jay is one of those people. So you actually set mine to be a little bit more sensitive. Mm -hmm. So it would say, oh, it would start to buzz a little bit earlier to keep me. So it did, I didn't look as good on the, on, the, on the feedback device, but I realized that, well, this is the next progression. So I just want to share people this from my own personal feedback. It may be very different for you. And I want to talk about this in just for just a moment, but there was three specific times where my heart rate variability would drop. And very strange, but we got the answer to this first one, and we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll share that. So the mm -hmm. first one is anytime I would bend over. So it could be 
I was I don't know, in my garden. I was just l- literally doing nothing challenging, but I was bent over. I'm not talking about exercise. So when I was bent over or chin down, even looking at my phone, reading an email, whatever it might be, heart rate variability would drop. Mm-hmm. The second time was during exercise, which is completely normal. That's going to happen while you're exercising. I'll let you explain that because you're the expert in space. And the third one, very, very strangely, but we figured that out last week, is actually when I eat. So Mm -hmm. when I eat, my heart rate variability drops. Now, the key for me is, and I'd love you to be able to explain this because this is not for everybody, but it's going to come up for other people as well. This chemo sensitivity to CO2. It was, the, it was really, again, I've studied CO2, oxygen in the tissues, all that before, but I never heard it really spoken about like this. So for me, and I want you to show how, uh, basically, I just want people to know how this works. James Nestor, you're speaking with him, you're doing your research, head down, turning off the parasympathetic nervous system. So I said, let me try my biofeedback with my head back, now that I'm recommending this, and then boom, heart rate variability drops. Talk mm-hmm. a little bit about this oxygen and heart rate variability and how it affects the nervous system. Because there's got to be one other person that finds this interesting besides myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a couple of things that are going on here. So one of the big things is that when you rotate your neck, I mean, I'm doing it on camera, but uh, forwards or backwards, you're, we haven't actually used this word yet, but it's a great time to bring it up but you're actually putting pressure on a cranial nerve that is extremely important for you to not put too much pressure on. And that's your 10th cranial nerve. And people may have heard it before. It's called your vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S. And what this vagus nerve is responsible for is that it is the break on your autonomic nervous system. And when we say break, it means that when it is stimulated and not blockaded, it is going to result in relaxation effect. And that is because it modulates something called the baroreflex mechanism, which is a blood pressure regulation mechanism. And it's also kind of uh, dictated by um, a couple of neurotransmitters, one being acetylcholine and the other being dopamine. And so when you actually put pressure on your neck or you rotate it in a weird way, or I've had athletes who have gotten kinks in their neck and they've had to kind of, you know, be, uh, be almost like holding it in a stiff position, they'll see their HRV tank. And that is because you're actually blockading or putting pressure on that vagus nerve and the vagus nerve doesn't like it. <laughs> and so you'll see HRV start to tank. And so what I tell people, especially if you're thinking about a biomechanics perspective, is that if you're sitting at a desk, especially like right now I'm at my desk, normally I'm standing, uh, but right now I'm sitting. But if I'm working in a really bad posture and I'm hunched over, or if I'm in a way that's just not ergonomical, that can actually have significant detriment and influence on my HRV and on my vagal tone, on my vagus nerve. So the importance of biomechanics uh, in posture, um, but especially in breathing, which I'm going to mention here in just a second, are extremely, extremely important important for people to remember. And uh, they sell those like little upright like devices that you can put like on your spine. I've never used one before, but it's supposedly like supposed to like help you to make sure that you're holding good posture. But for people who are slouching and for people who are, you know, not utilizing great ergonomical mechanics, probably want to consider something to kind of help coach them along that way, or just increase their level of self-awareness. And every time they do it and they feel their leaf device go off, remember, okay, upright posture, kind of get myself into a much more open stance. Now, when we're talking about chemosensitivity and we're talking about kind of oxygen and CO2 and gas exchange within the lungs, this is something that um, is playing an ever great importance on HRV or more specifically on nervous system modulation. The way I look at it is that HRV uh, is just the metric. Um, So HRV in and of itself isn't the aim. The aim is to really get at nervous system modulation. And what nervous system modulation means is control. Control over the nervous system to be able to turn on the gas pedal when you need to and pump the brakes when you need to. And one of the things that we've really found out through kind of the work of Patrick McCune, through the work of James Nestor and individuals who brought to light the importance of nasal breathing, but also have brought to the light um, the importance of gas exchange on heart rate variability and nervous system functioning, is that we found that a lot of people, especially people who tend to breathe with their mouths and as opposed to nose, um, or people who have more dysfunctional breathing and breathe more thoracically, which is from the chest, as opposed to diaphragmatically, which is from the belly, 
a lot of difficulty with overall gas exchange and gas utilization. So we know that the two most important gases for breathing are CO2 and oxygen. And a lot of people just consider or thought CO2 was just this excessive waste gas. So it was just this thing we expelled and plants thrived on it. And when plants thrive, we thrive because we breathe in their oxygen. And part of it is true. CO2 is an, ex uh, we expel excessive CO2, stuff that we're not going to use. However, we can actually, and we do actually, actually want to utilize CO2 in a very effective way. And this is because CO2 actually acts as the key in our hemoglobin and blood cells to unleash and unrelease uh, oxygen to be utilized within the blood. And so when we're not, uh, when we're overly sensitive to CO2, which means that maybe we can't hold our breath very long, maybe we have exercise induced asthma or just asthma in general, then what we see with these individuals is that their nervous system tends to be really, really taxed, very low. HRV amongst the individuals with asthma or extra exercise induced asthma or those with dysfunctional breathing. And so one of the things that I work on with a lot of people is actually increasing chemosensitivity to CO2, which means our ability to tolerate CO2. Because we know that as our ability to tolerate CO2, which is like through breath holding or very light breathing, we call this buteco breathing. Uh, when we increase that, then we actually see a modulation of the nervous system and build it and we build resiliency in the the nervous system. So I teach like these oxygen advantage practices all the time to my clientele so that they can learn to essentially be a free diver, um, but do it kind of in their everyday life. And what they see is kind of these enormous results in their ability to regulate HRV. If you don't mind, I would love to share that one tip because I want people to be, there's so much to think about, but there's one tip that you gave me the other day that I'm not doing well at. And I haven't even reported <laughs> back to you on that. I yeah. got 12 to 15 steps every single time right. before I had that, what do you call it? Oxygen starvation or yeah, air and, hunger, right? the hunger, oxygen mm. hunger. Like I wanted, I needed to take that breath back in and, but yes. you warned me ahead of time it was going to happen. You're going to try to get to 40 steps or 60 steps. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. right away, you know, was honest with myself, blew out all that oxygen. I would love you to explain it since you're the one who taught me this. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, 12 steps, 15 steps. That's it. But it, it really does show me though. So I'm not, I'm never upset at these things because now it says, okay, you need to work on this. It is an actual issue. And before I do have you explain that, because I always love to give one takeaway. And I think this is a big takeaway to help people with is that I believe that there's, and I'm going to make the correlation in the future. I'll maybe work with you on this. I think there's a huge relationship between the ectomorph body type uh, or mm -hmm. Vata based body type and constitution. It's higher prevalence of sympathetic nervous system dominance and it's lower HRV. And because there's just much more catabolism in the, in the body in an ectomorph, they're always in more of a state of anxiety and simply the, the body's less resilient to stress. And I think that there is a direct correlation with heart rate variability. I'd love to be able to do some research on that in the future. Yeah. But I also think that they're not great utilizers of CO2 and be able to get the oxygen into their body. And when you look at it in terms of Ayurveda, they just say like, hey, listen, the vata body type is not good at oxygen. It's actually, it's funny because vata means essentially flow or movement specifically, and they're kind of always going. But with that, they're actually getting less oxygen to the tissues because their body is in more of a constricted, tight, locked down uh, sympathetic nervous system dominance. Mm -hmm. So one thing, because this is simple for everybody to do, is you can kind of just test your chemosensitivity to CO2, carbon dioxide right now. What is that one thing that you gave me last week to do? Yeah. So what, no, it's a great, great question. So one of the things that I gave you was a practice, which is, we call it IHHT. Um, and then I'll, that's the longer version, um, even though that's the, the acronym. IHHT is intermittent hypercapnic hypoxic training. And another way to think about it is that we're simulating high altitude training. Um, and that's what I like to kind of refer to it as because IHHT is just kind of a little bit confusing for people. But basically what this practice is, is that this operates as a sympathetic stressor or a sympathetic arousal. So this actually puts your body into a fight or flight response. Very similar to like someone would do with like, let's say Wim Hof breathing. Now this is very different from Wim Hof breathing, an entirely different um, kind of take on things. But the whole idea for this is to provide a stressor to the nervous system, help you to develop more chemosensitivity to CO2 so that you can rebuild the nervous system back in a more resilient and foundational way. And so the 
exercise that I gave you was that I had you, I told you, I want you to go outside and walk around normal pace. We're not speed walking. We're not running. We're just doing a normal paced walk from anywhere from about 30 seconds to one minute just to warm yourself up. And then what you do is you inhale normally, you exhale normally, and then you can either pinch your nose or just make sure that you hold your breath to where you're not leaking air. And then you walk as many paces as you can until you feel a strong air hunger to breathe in. And the idea here is to count the number of paces because the paces are important from a research-based perspective. What we found is, is that people who may either have dysfunctional breathing or some kind of um, inoperational breathing and have a very low chemosensitivity to CO2 and may have a hard time with regulating the nervous system as easily really is anything below about 40. Um, and the whole goal is to get to 40. Anything below 25 is kind of really taxed. And again, that's not to say that if you get below 25, like, oh, throw up the cleats, like you're never going to be able to do anything athletic. That's not true at all. I've seen people go from where you are right now, 12 or 15 breaths up to 80 and 100 through this type of training. And when they get up to 80 and 100, their heart rate variability is sky high. And again, the idea is that you're going to, and you do this for a few cycles. So you, after, and I should say too, after you release the air out from your breath hold, or I should say you take air in because you've already released your air out, you take air in, then you keep your breaths very, very small and slightly shallow. So very light is a better way of putting it for about six to eight breaths. And then after that normal breathing, and then after 30 seconds of rest, then you do it again and you do it for about eight to 10 cycles. You don't want want to pass out. Um, so I recommend wearing an SPO2 monitor. And if you're wearing an SPO2 monitor on your finger, watch out for going below 85. Like you don't want to necessarily go below 85. Some people can push it to about 80, but nothing, definitely nothing below 80 when you're doing this type of training, especially initially. But this is a very, very valuable exercise. And you may think it sounds crazy or will look goofy. It may <laughs> look a little bit goofy. Nobody actually will know unless they're like, why is he huffing and puffing over there? Or is she huffing and puffing over there? But what you'll notice is that this hormetic stressor, and we call it a hormetic stressor because it's an environmental stressor that will then help you to build back stronger because if you, if you do it too long, it'll be taxing and toxic on the system. So we want to keep it as a hormetic stressor and not push it too far, which is why, again, uh, SpO2 does, shouldn't go below 85 and you shouldn't do it for more than about eight to 10 cycles. But it's just an incredible exercise. But I will tell people, and I'm sure you can attest to this, it is hard. <laughs> it is not easy. It is very, very difficult. And it can be a little bit discouraging the first time you do it. And the more and more you practice this, especially if it's daily practice, you'll find yourself up to 40, 60, and 80. And if you get to 80, that's the, that's what we kind of consider the elite zone. That's like where the big time athletes are getting to. <laughs> it's, it's challenge accepted. Yes. So, let's go. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I actually, I like to find the things I need to improve. You know, I think a lot of people in, in my health community, you know, we're helping them with uh, autoimmune issues, thyroid issues, cholesterol, blood pressure, whatever it might be, but there's always going to be a next level. So mm -hmm. for me, again, I've said this before and I truly mean it that every single year I celebrate another birthday chronologically, but I feel better. I feel better this year than I did last year. And last year I felt great. And last year I felt better than the year before. So it's mm -hmm. about doing things like this where you're constantly improving. Like that's the goal. And so now I find something that I need to improve. And when Jay mentions that this is a hermetic stressor, and you've heard me say this before, be careful with your hermetic stresses. You want to push your body to the ability that it's able to withstand right now. When I was in college, I couldn't play a pickup basketball game. Now it's okay. So, but now, you know, I couldn't run a marathon or I'd be wiped out the next day. And that, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like, look at your hermetic stressors. But the reason why this hermetic stressor is a little different than saying, oh, I'm going to do sauna or I'm going to do cold therapy or I'm going to do Wim Hof or I'm going to do whatever it might be. Actually, Wim Hof plays along with this, but I actually, I prefer the buteco breathing more and nothing against Wim Hof and that style of breathing. There's, I appreciate that. It's just less sympathetic nervous system dominance where if you don't know how to induce parasympathetic response with Wim Hof breathing, you are going to stimulate dopamine. You're going to stimulate norepinephrine. And in the short term, yeah, you feel boundless energy, but in the long term, you're burning out that HPA access. So I actually like the Buteyko breathing which induces parasympathetic nervous system activity. And it builds up this, correct me if I'm wrong though, it builds this, the IAH, IHHT mm -hmm. builds up CO2 in the bloodstream. If mm -hmm. you build up CO2 in the bloodstream, oxygen then is pushed into the tissues. Is that correct? That, that is absolutely correct. Yes. 
So we're getting the benefit then of oxygenating our tissues, which is going to help with mitochondrial function. It's going to help with your energy. It's going to help with uh, release brain fog, many of these different things. But you're not going to feel great in the process getting there. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's like running. It's like any of these things. It's going to feel pretty terrible in the beginning, but that's why you ease into it. So I only did three rounds. Jay's recommending eight eight to 10 or so. I did three because I'm like, you know what? I don't need to prove a point to myself today. I'm honest with myself and I get right. about 12 to 15 steps. But also I want people, because you could easily mess up this exercise. So the way that you're going to get it right is to take normal, maybe like five normal breaths in and out, just normal, not hyper oxygenated in your body. And then after the exhale, make sure all the air is out. Then pinch your nose or simply don't allow any air leakage in and then walk because Mm -hmm. and walk normally because if you don't breathe out all the oxygen well sure then i could walk for 80 steps no problem so Mm -hmm. it's it's pushing out all of the o2 or all of the carbon dioxide all of your body's ability to get air out of your lungs not forcing it just normally and then walk from there is that correct yeah, that's correct. So, you know, if you were to take the air in and then hold the air in, what you might find too is that yes, you're going to get a hypercapnic buildup. So that's a high CO2 buildup. But if you look at an SpO2 monitor, you're not going to get as much of the hypoxia. And the hypoxia, uh, to an extent, again, we have to make that clear. We don't want people <laughs> passing out on us. The hypoxia is quite normal and effective as well for this type of practice. So we want to expel all the air. And when, when that happens, you're almost, uh, almost immediately going to have a hypercapnic type feel. It's going to feel like, oh goodness, like I should have taken a breath in. Um, Whereas if you breathe in air, yeah, you're going to be able to walk 60, 70, 80 without any problem. And it's because you're not experiencing a significant of a hypoxic event or or much at all. And you're definitely not experiencing as much of a hypercapnic event, which is high CO2. So yeah, definitely expel all the air out, then hold. And, and I, do, I do want to move on because I think this was a good tip, but there's so much more to talk about. So mm-hmm. the last thing I will say is don't go to the point, like you said, where you get dizzy, lightheaded, but also don't go to the point where you need to then take a huge breath of air in. You, so the goal is actually, as Jay just said, you then start to go back to normal breathing in through your nose, out through your nose. If you can, don't open your mouth at all, uh, maybe to exhale that last breath or so to get it all out, but that's about it. And um, I think it's going to be really beneficial. Now, one thing I will share with you, though, is you might say, well, how, how come I'm only at 12 to 15 steps, and, and, but I'm still doing well, and I can still go on a, a 5K run, you know, twice, three times a week, no problem, all of those different things that I'm not struggling with oxygen. And that's where I want to move next is that my ability to regulate my nervous system is now well adapted. So mm-hmm. I can catch myself in that sympathetic nervous state or that more tense state and then be able to calm and relax my body. And so what I've learned is by using the certain devices, LEAF in particular, that I can go from whatever my HRV is to doubling that within about 90 seconds. And so that allows me when I'm in Colorado and I'm at altitude, I don't experience altitude sickness, but I should because I have that kind of chemosensitivity to CO2. So I think the difference really comes back to, and again, people have heard me say this quote before, you know, immortality, not that I think I'm immortal, but it would be great (laughs) to be able to live as long as possible. But there's an Ayurvedic quote that goes, um, the secret to immortality is infinite flexibility. Mm -hmm. So as Jay stated in the beginning, I might not have the best heart rate variability in the world. It's not bad. It's above average for my age. But what I'm able to do is when it counts, when I'm stressed, I'm able to turn it off. I'm able to turn off that sympathetic nervous system, breathe, relax. And that simply just came with practice of not knowing what heart rate variability was, Mm -hmm. but certainly knowing what the HeartMath Institute that my mentor introduced me to as well. So let's talk a little bit about biofeedback. Let's talk a little bit about that flexibility in terms of your heart rate variability. Yeah, you know, it is so vastly important for your listeners to realize that, again, the baseline HRV, while we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, let's not compare it to a normative basis, let's just do a self comparison, shouldn't be the end all be all. Again, I will take the individual who has an HRV of 30, but can modulate it up to 70 with biofeedback compared to the HRV of 100 and only modulate it up to 101 or 102. These are individuals who, yes, one on paper looks like they have a significantly higher HRV because they do, but control over the nervous system is a completely different story. And so with the utilization of something like biofeedback or HRV biofeedback, which is what the LEAF device works as, it's what I do as a clinician. 
is biofeedback is utilizing your, your biology as feedback so that you gain self-awareness into your nervous system functioning and stress response. And then you learn how to, and this is the kicker, self-regulate that response. And so while you like, like you said, your, your chemosensitivity to CO2 might be rather low right now. I mean, you're trying to develop it. The reason you can go out and, you know, get into high altitude and still be fine and not get sick is because when you need to control your nervous system, you've got control control over it. You have the tools for it. And that's what biofeedback is all about teaching you. It's teaching different types of techniques, whether it's breathwork techniques, mindfulness meditation techniques, different little intricate biohacks that I'll, that I'll provide. All of these things help teach you how to gain better reins over your HRV. So here's the kind of uh, analogy or the kind of illustration that I like to, to utilize. So if you think about kind of like your nervous system being a dog on a leash, for most people, their nervous system at some point they have that dog on the leash and they're able to control it. But due to different environmental stressors, life stressors, toxins, relational stressors on their nervous system, the dog finds its way off the leash and they're running around aimlessly trying to chase this thing down and they're exhausted. They're worn out. They've got adrenal fatigue. Their HPA axis is dysregulated. They've just got this host of problems. Whereas biofeedback, one of its tools is teaching you, yes, you need to catch that dog, but also put it on the leash. And one of the things that I always point out is that, you know, with a dog, if you're walking on a leash, let's think about a bigger dog too, is that sometimes when that dog senses something, it may pull you in one direction and pull you in another direction. But if as long as you've got that leash really wrapped up onto you and you have kind of the strength and resilience for it to not drag you on the ground or for you to break it off, then that is when you have control. And that's what we're doing with our nervous system is that we're going to feel those tugs and pulls of the dog with those tugs and pulls and taxing on our nervous system. We just need to be able to develop the tools, the specific tools needed in order to keep it on the leash so that when it does pull us, we don't get pulled away with it. Yeah. Let's start to explore what biofeedback is since Mm -hmm. there's two things that have raised my heart rate variability more than anything else. And that has been aerobic cardio, which is very, very strange. But again, I first saw that when I was looking into telomere length and that Mm -hmm. telomere length is not increased through anaerobic exercise, but actually through aerobic based exercise. However, since some anaerobic exercise can actually increase aerobic capacity, it therefore should probably increase telomere length as well, but we won't get into that today. But Mm -hmm. if you're doing aerobic-based work, which is increasing, I would actually say CO2 in your bloodstream, Mm -hmm. then you're most likely getting oxygen into your tissues to a better degree. And although aerobic exercise is taxing, it is not a direct heavy response on the nervous system unless you're pushing past sprint level or really taxing the body. So you can actually get into this flow and this kind of rhythm and your rate of perceived exertion is actually less. So there's different theories behind it, but aerobic based exercise, which my mind has been telling me for many years to get back into for various reasons, but like anybody who's in body transformation, those types of things, you're like, yeah, it's kind of pointless because I can transform my body without aerobic exercise. However, it's not always about the external. It's about the internal is what I'm starting to kind of get more and more into. So aerobic exercise and biofeedback were the Mm -hmm. two game changers for me. And Jay helped me since I've been working with him to add 24 points to my HRV. So I just want to let you know, and that was in about a six week period of time. That's not going to happen for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, I was quite diligent about introducing these things, aerobic exercise two to three times a week, and then also biofeedback daily. I would, and I would do it two to three times a day. I would just set an Mm -hmm. alarm on my phone. It's only three minutes long. So easy. First thing in the morning, and then before bed, and then I would try to do it right before I ate lunch, which also then increases my mindful eating because now mm-hmm. I'm in the parasympathetic nervous system so I can better digest my food. So if I can recommend three times a day for three minutes, it's super easy. And it essentially is mimicking meditation because you're focused on a wave. You're actually, your body breathing in and exhaling out. I'm going to have you explain biofeedback to a greater degree. And then also if you could give some of your tips as to what you've seen increase HRV as well. Yeah. So, you know, with biofeedback, really what we're doing is that we, at the end, it's all about learning and conditioning. And so when I say learning and conditioning, I'm really about taking the thermostat in an upward direction to come back to that analogy. And the way we do that is that we train it over and over and over and we condition it over and over and over. Because with life stressors that we encounter, especially when we get a little bit older, I think a lot of it is post-college for many individuals. So around that 21, 22 year old, 
range. And especially when you get into your 30s, the nervous system starts becoming less resilient if you don't have it trained well. And so what this all is about is about training it through different techniques to turn the thermostat in an upward direction. Because with stress on the nervous system, you might see it kind of turn the thermostat downward because it says, well, you're obviously being chased by a mountain lion all the time. So let me just keep your sympathetic nervous system ramped up into high gear. And uh, because there's no need for you to kind of go up and down, like you're always being attacked. And that's kind of the way the brain is a little bit stupid. Sometimes it's very intelligent, but it's also very unintelligent because sometimes the communication it's receiving from your body is that you're obviously being about to be eaten by a mountain lion. And so what biofeedback does is it helps us to train a relaxation response or a vagal response through different breath work techniques, through different meditative techniques, so that we can send the signal. And this is very uh, similar to Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory. We send the signal via our vagus nerve to the brain to say, obviously, I'm not being chased by a mountain lion. I have the ability to stop and breathe and regulate my response to stress right now, which means that the mountain lion is not about to chase me because we would never do that if the mountain lion was actually chasing us. And when I say mountain lion, I'm speaking of everyday stressors that we encounter, right? Somebody cuts us off on the road. We experience a little bit of financial hardship, relational hardship, and all of these things are constant signals to the brain to keep the gas pedal running. And what biofeedback does is it teaches you how to engage the brake, how to engage the parasympathetic response. And so for a lot of people, it's engaging in resonant frequency breathing. Like I mentioned earlier, this is the breathing pattern that maximizes heart rate variability. And the waves that you were talking about earlier, if you've ever used like the, the heart math um, M wave two or the inner balance or the, the leaf device, you'll see these rolling hills that you create when you are breathing at a very slow respiratory rate or a low cadence. And what that is, is that is actually a physiological arrhythmic process. It's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia or RSA. And we know that as we inhale, the gas pedal is pressed down, the heart rate increases. And then as we exhale and extend the exhalation, the brake pedal goes on. And so the reason it's important to press the gas uh, on and then press the brake on is that is true modulation. That's up and down and up and down. And the nervous system becomes more resilient to the up and down and up and down the more and more it experiences it. So biofeedback, especially when it's performed each and every day and with a device like LEAF performed all the time because it's signaling you to when to practice, it's something that we condition as a reflex to our response to stress over time. I know that was a little bit long-winded, but hopefully that unpacked that concept. And yeah, then, oh absolutely. yeah, and I can give more of examples of what, what can be good in, in increasing HRV, but I figured I'd pause there. Yeah, let's, let's go over those additional ones as well. But one thing I just want, if people are trying to visualize what biofeedback is, again, you can use um, heart math. Uh, I think HRV does it as well. Leaf, mm -hmm. in my opinion, Leaf is the best one. They, they still, you know, again, these are all tech companies. I love tech. Everything gets better every single year. The original Aura Ring, not as great as the Aura Ring today. Much, right. much better. Eventually, the Apple Watch will be able to properly track HRV, I believe, in the future too. The problem is that with an Apple Watch, unlike the Leaf or the Aura Ring, you can't turn off the Bluetooth. You can't put it mm -hmm. in airplane mode. So you're constantly being bombarded with more and more EMFs, electric radiation, et cetera. But what biofeedback would look like is, again, you can be looking at the app on your phone or whatever it might be, or the device with the heart math, is that you're going to see, it's going to basically tell you to breathe in for about three seconds or so. And then what you do is you, I find you actually get benefit from holding that breath, pausing for a moment, because the pause builds up tension. That's what I've realized. Mm -hmm. And then the exhale releases the tension and induces then the parasympathetic response through that vagal tone. And then the exhale is going to be more like five seconds. It's not exact, but when you look at yogic breathing, when you look at any type of parasympathetic breathing, you always want the exhale to be relaxed and longer than your inhale breath. And of course, you want your inhale breath being more of a belly or diaphragmatic breath. Um, that's not as technical as, as exactly how it's broken down, but the device actually buzzes when you should exhale and stops buzzing when you should inhale. So it makes it pretty easy for you to mm -hmm. kind of follow the pattern. And then, as Jay was saying, you actually get to see those wave patterns. And the more they begin to become symmetrical patterns, basically, all the waves look the same, the more resonant frequency or the more of a resonant frequency you're in. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Would you say? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, kind of we, we look at something called amplitude. So that's kind of where the valley is. So the lowest part of your HRV, which would be your lowest heart rate. And then we look at the highest heart rate. And then we just take the highest minus the lowest. And that would be heart rate variability amplitude. This is not something that uh, the device does for you. But this is something that I do when I'm coaching people as I look at the amplitude. And really anything over 10 in amplitude is where I want people to be. If you're looking at peak performance and optimization, we're looking at over 20. So for instance, if you start off at, uh, at 70, then in order to get kind of that amplitude of, um, of 20, that would be up to 90 and then back down to 70. Now, if you get up to 100, that's even better. That's a 30 amplitude. And so, yeah, that those rolling hills, you want to see them being nice and symmetrical and nice and smooth because those are going to coincide with the smoothness or the biomechanics of your breathing. And the biomechanics of your breathing are just as important as the cadence of your breathing. Because if you're breathing thoracically or from your chest and not from your belly and in your diaphragm, then you're not going to get nearly as much of a stimulation of vagal tone the reason being is because when we think about the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, it actually innervates, which means it's, it connects to the lower part of our lungs. And so to stimulate the lower part of our lungs, we want to expand the lower part of our lungs. And so I have people all the time, they're like, I got my cadence down, but I'm not experiencing any changes in HRV. And then when we start to talk about the breath mechanics, they're still up in their chest. And so I always teach to move down to the belly, almost visualize like you're blowing up a balloon in your belly on the inhale, and then a gentle pull with your belly button towards your spine on the exhale. And so you can feel your hand on your belly when you do this, if you put your hand right above your navel, or you can put your hands to the sides, like right where your intercostal muscles are, and you can feel the expansion of your rib cage on the breath. That's another great way to do it. So it's just kind of keeping in mind, yes, the cadence and the rhythm, those hills, but also to keep in mind the biomechanics because the biomechanics are going to dictate those hills even more so than your cadence or your respiratory rate. And then one thing I just want to add is that typically my aura ring is about eight to 10 points lower than my leaf device because my heart rate variability, like many people, is actually lower at night, potentially because of an oxygen-based issue when you're lying down, typically mm -hmm. not getting in as much oxygen. I have, I'm actually, my next stage, my next evolution will actually be malt taping at night, mm -hmm. do it during the day, but I essentially can't breathe out of my right nostril. Uh, I have a deviated septum. I broke my nose when I was under a year old. It just formed uh, that way. But at the same time, I can. Now that I've eliminated my allergies, I've eliminated my food sensitivities, I can basically breathe through my nose with my mouth closed. The oxygen isn't as great. However, using this Buteco breathing, and I will actually be doing a follow-up interview on this specifically with uh, Patrick McEwen, is awesome. that we'll go over then that type of breathing, which goes hand in hand with what Jay is teaching you right now. So um, just want to mention that. I, I think uh, maybe you feel the same. The, the aura ring is going to be slightly lower because it's typically doing your overnight HRV. And then you can answer that. But then let's flow into maybe two or three tips, not all of them, but two or three tips sure. we can give people that will help them to improve their HRV in everyday life. And then we'll start to kind of pull everything together for people. Okay, sounds good. Well, so let me hit on the aura ring real quick. So if you look on the aura ring, if anybody has one um, and you take it off, you'll see three different sensors at the bottom. Those are infrared light sensors and we call this PPG or photoplasmography in the HRV world. And this is a good valuable measurement of blood volume pulse. So basically at the peak of the pulse of your blood that's being detected by these infrared lights, you'll see um, at that time, kind of that's, that'll be kind of like the mark of the, of the heartbeat. Yeah, there we go. And so this is a very valuable way of doing it. It's a very non-invasive way. It takes no electrodes. You just throw it on. It's kind of like the heart math, the ear clip. It's the same technology. If you ever gone to the hospital and they put the finger blood volume pulse on you, that's exactly the same technology. And it's just medical grade with a very high rate of detection. So with these devices, one of the problems that you can end up having, and I've seen this happen quite often, is that if it moves a little bit or gets slightly off centered, then readings are going to be effective. So the consistency with the device like this can sometimes be be a little bit wonky, but it's really not bad. It's actually a very good device. But I find that the, if you want the most accurate readings possible, then you're going to really want to look for an EKG device. So something like the Leaf or the Polar H10 chest strap, uh, which is like a running chest strap for heart rate, but you use it with the Elite HRV app and you get some really great data points that way. So that might be kind of the difference in some of the numbers, but also you're right if there's kind of an inhibition of oxygenation 
at night, then you're going to see that affect overall HRV scores. And, you know, I see actually with a lot of individuals who uh, sleep on their back, interestingly enough, the gravitational pull for them on their chest actually leads to reduced oxygenation. And for a lot of these people, I'll actually have them sleep on their side and their HRV goes up like consistently, like 10 to 15 points. Um, and so it's something worth considering. These are just little hacks um, that are that can be simple or difficult. I mean, changing your sleeping patterns can be difficult, but there's something to consider. As far as kind of like other little things that you can do. So I'm huge into hacking the vagus nerve. Um, I really like the idea of biohacking the vagus nerve, but only when you have everything else in place, when things are right from a nutritional standpoint, from an exercise standpoint, even from a psychological and relational uh, standpoint, social standpoint, and then a breath work and meditative standpoint. So meditation and breath work, we've kind of already covered, but those are valuable HRV modulators. The other things are a little bit maybe more unconventional. And some of them are hermetic stressors um, that, that we've talked about a little bit, but I'll briefly kind of mention them. My favorite one, if you're able to do this, and not everybody should be doing this or is able to do it, you have to know thyself and utilize your metrics, is cold thermogenesis. So that is ex- that's cold exposure. For some people, it's going to be too taxing right now for your nervous system. Build it back through some biofeedback, some breath breath work and some exercise and then try it when you have a resilient nervous system. But if you if you do, if you have a pretty good foundational nervous system, cold thermogenesis is great. So that could be hot, cold contrast showers, cold plunges, kind of those things are great. If you measure HRV during and after a cold plunge, you are going to see it tank like a rock and that's okay. If you, if you wear your device while you're exercising, you're going to see it tank like a rock. The reason being is because that is increasing a sympathetic response and that's not a bad thing if you do it in a well-managed hormetic way. <laughs> so you can overdo it though. So that's one thing that I recommend. Another really cool tip that I've been using here recently that Ben Greenfield and I talked about on his podcast is there was a research study that actually looked at just placing a gentle ice pack during kind of transient experiences of stress or anxiety, a gentle ice pack right on the left or right side of the neck, um, or even an ice cube just for kind of a small short-term cold exposure. That right there is sitting on top of your vagus nerve. And when vagus nerve experiences that cold chill, um, it actually will stimulate a little bit of a stressor. But as soon as you kind of pull it off, most people feel kind of like a cool down of their vagus nerve and they feel that relaxation response. So a great hack that I've been using if I've had a stressful day is just to go get an ice pack from my kitchen and just gently place it on my neck for about 10 to 15 seconds. And then I'm kind of good to go. That's so a great cool. Tip. Yeah, really love it. I, like I love it. The other thing um, that I'll mention that you and I talked about here, I think this is foundational. This is not even a biohack. This is foundational. Ice packs on the neck might be a little bit of a hack, but this is just foundational, is getting outside and getting quality sunlight. Um, because we know that there's a huge correlation between, yes, inflammation, but also a lowered vitamin D and taxed nervous system. So we know that when vitamin D is suppressed, we actually see that go hand in hand with lowered HRV. And I've seen plenty of people who I'm a big advocate of getting, not only just getting outside, but getting grounded to the earth's electrical, electromagnetic field. So being barefoot on the ground and getting sunlight kind of both in conjunction. And we see that as people do this and they elevate naturally their levels of, of, of vitamin D, that we see some subsequent increases in HRV. So I'm totally about getting sunlight for so many reasons, but from an HRV modulation perspective and increase in the baseline, one that I, one that I always go to. And you know, I've got a million of these hacks that I can recommend, but you know, I don't want to get too long in the tooth. So I figured I'll, I'll leave them at that unless there's anything else you wanted me to mention. Well, no, I mean, those are, those are fantastic. And I think that's cause I, what I don't want to do is overwhelm people with possibility so that they don't get started. Right. Mm-hmm. And without a doubt, it's the exercise. It's doing a little bit of sauna, maybe a little bit of cold. I'll tell you one way that I got started with cold therapy that actually translated to better sleep and better overnight HRV by about five or six points is really making sure my bedroom is cool at night. Mm -hmm. So for, and then sometimes just not sleeping with any blanket at all. So what I found was the nights that I exposed myself to a little bit more cold, my body certainly had to get used to it a little bit. And it actually, in the beginning, was a little bit too much of a hermetic stressor. And I would just say, okay, I'm going to put on a little bit more clothes than at night once I started to get too cold. But right. After that, I found that my body began to self-regulate to a better degree. And really what we're talking about today is teaching your body to become more resilient. Mm -hmm. And you are really bulletproofing yourself to stress. And that's what I'm trying to do with each and every year. How do I get more resilient to stress? Because you can't fully eliminate stress in your life. 
So what happens is you get used to a certain amount of stress, then dial it up, not 10X, just one more degree. And then you'll be able to go from there. I remember doing cold exposure just a couple years back. And I was like, well, if a little's good, I'm going to go in for six or eight minutes. And it was way too much. I actually then started mm-hmm. to get like the dryness in my throat. I was like, oh, now I'm getting a cold. Well, what's going on here? Too much. Three to five minutes of that cold exposure. That's all you need. Two to three minutes. And then you can crank it up a little bit if you want. But again, more isn't always better. Going into the sauna at 200 degrees for 40 minutes is not always better than 165 degrees for 30 minutes or so. So, so like kind of know where you're at right now. And then there are upper limits. So the, the cold bedroom at night, is nice. A lot of people use a chili pad. I'm not an advocate of anything EMFs in the bedroom. So, you know, what I I actually, what I'm going to do is put a little cold on my neck now, right before I get into bed. I think that's Mm -hmm. a great idea. So I'm going to start to try to use that right away. And then, um, and simply going for a walk after dinner, like turn on that parasympathetic nervous system. Walking Mm -hmm. induces the PNS. So those are great tips. One thing though, I, I can't, I haven't asked you this yet. So before we end the show, I want to ask you, what do you think the future of biofeedback or improving heart rate variability is? Because I see it as some type of photo sensitivity based device with lights, with some type of diode, with basically kinesio taping or something with that vagal nerve in order to kind of pull you back into the parasympathetic nervous system. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I've, I've, yeah. I think that it's probably going to go in that direction. Right. There's so many endless possibilities here. I'm very excited about the future of HRV training and biohacking HRV. You know, I don't want people to put the cart before the horse and think that, oh, I'll just kind of hold out and wait for these cool bio, t- you know, biohacking technologies like, you know, vagal stimulators. However, it will, it'll be a great way to augment all the great things that we're doing, like nutrition and sunlight exposure and, you know, all these other things we mentioned. Um, however, you know, there are some really cool devices out there that um, are getting at what kind of what you're saying. And one of the really cool ones that I've been playing around with a lot, I've actually talked a lot with this company. And then right now I don't have any affiliation with this company, but I've really enjoyed kind of my, my experience and kind of working with others who have utilized them is that uh, the company Nucalm, N-U-C-L-M. So Nucalm has actually uh, introduced kind of what they, it's a bioacoustic software that utilizes a disc that's put on your pericardium six um, acupressure point on your wrist. And uh, kind of what they propose is that that uh, this device through the pericardium six acupressure point is supposed to help radiate and run through um, up to the vagus nerve and then stimulate vagal tone. Um, So it's a very non-invasive way you put on headphones and utilize this neuroacoustic software. So it's very um, much based in neuroscience. And then it uh, it basically resonates with this disc. Um, And so it is the, it is one of the most interesting technologies I think that is out there. And I'm very excited to see where it goes because they've already come like leaps and bounds. And I know that Ben Greenfield, this is one of his non-negotiables is that he knew calms every single day. And so I think that that's one of the futures is utilizing some of these wearables that will stimulate vagal tone and do so in a, in the least invasive way, because there are vagal stimulators, like they're actual electrical stimulators that you can put on your vagus nerve, but you will never see me with one of those. And the reason being is because while there can be some efficacy for some people, those things emit a lot of EMF and I don't want EMF on my vagus nerve, but also too, it causes the vagus nerve to expect something. It expects that if we want to modulate it, then I need that little device. So it becomes essentially like uh, not tolerant of it, but it, it, it desires kind of that in an effort to make change. And so I'm weary about some of those things, but I do like a device like the Nucom because I think it's more of an augmenting device than it is anything. That's one thing that I really like. There's some other kind of cool devices that are out there, but in terms of biofeedback, I think we're going to get much more specific. We're going to see a lot more nuanced data, a lot more great research on different techniques to help modulate the nervous system. And I think that HRV from a wearables and consumer-based standpoint, it's just going to be a natural part of everybody's kind of daily routine is to throw on a device like the Leaf or something even much better out there than the Leaf device. So it's exciting. Um, It's going to be a very, very interesting world in the next like 10 years for all of those who are looking at like peak optimization and health optimization. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And for those people right now, the new calm haven't really talked about it before only available to practitioners in the past. I've been using it myself in my practice for a bit, but for anybody who's been listening to the podcast for a while, you've heard me talk about binaural beats. So new calm is essentially owns their own type of binaural beats 
Mm-hmm. And they, what they used to do was have a TENS unit that stimulated some of the nerves in the back of the neck as well. And right. the ones they're doing right now on the wrists and ankles actually is a company that I spoke about before in this podcast called HUSO, H-U-S-O. Mm-hmm. So if you combine something like Whole Tones Binaural Beats with the HUSO, or HUSO actually comes with their own binaural beats, you'll be able to mimic that right at home as well. And then I think in the future, you were saying to me too, Newcom is actually going to come out with a uh, consumer level device, not just a, mm-hmm. because originally it was actually a dentist's office to help right. calm people's anxiety, but a great, great device. It's just cost many thousands of dollars uh, yeah. to get they're into really it. They're working on getting that down. I think that the last I heard um, is that they're going to make it kind of like what Whoop does, like a $30, $40 a month type thing instead of like a $7,000 investment. So in an incredible level of technology, the amount of money they put in for research and development in New Calm is insane. Uh, but it, it And that's why the price is so high on that thing. But for me, again, if you've got the finances and, you're, and you've already optimized other areas and you're looking to kind of hack it, for me, it has been like a game changer. It's been an amazing tool and device that I use daily. Awesome. I mean, we, I literally could talk about this for another hour, two <laughs> oh, <me> hours. <laughs> we, we talk every couple of weeks anyways, yeah. giving me my yeah. feedback. I just, the last thing I'll leave people with is this, is that your numbers are not static. So you're going to begin to work on your HRV. And with some of this work after a couple of weeks, it might start to come up a little bit. It's just like, it's like weight loss as well. Then you'll have a week where you might gain a little bit of weight. Well, in this case, your HRV might actually drop a little bit because of life stress, poor sleep, kids are sick, meetings at work, whatever might happen. And that's okay. And then, because the goal is over the next 12 weeks, 16 weeks, where did you start? And then where did you end? And so if everyone set a goal for themselves to raise their HRV on average by about five points in the next 12 weeks or so, I think that would be a great place to start because you're going to, as Jay's been alluding to, and I say myself, you don't use any of these extra devices. Yes, I love binaural beats. I love all these things. Mm -hmm. But really, you're working on diet, exercise, stress reduction, reducing toxins, your rest and your sleep, emotional balance, your supplement protocols, which we didn't even get to today, and (laughs) your um, success mindset. So that's the de-stress protocol I teach every single day in my practice. I've spoke about it many, many times. But then after that, you can get, okay, what's that next level? How can we begin to do these specific things? So I really encourage anybody who wants to work with Jay, Jay does um, have on a monthly basis, a few openings available. So you can go to his website, which is thrive-wellness.com. And Jay will be teaching classes on this in the future. But what I want to do today is everyone head on over to this specific podcast show notes page, because I'm going to link up a podcast I did on earthing. We kind of glazed over earthing. Mm -hmm. I'll link one up on binaural beats. I'll link one up on the HUSO. So what we'll do is we'll give you some background information and then head over to thrive-wellness.com where you're going to be able to find out more about Jay, his practice, all the different things that he does. And all of our sessions are virtual. I'm in Maine right now. Mm -hmm. Jay's in South Carolina. And so it's very easy for us to get over a Zoom call, Skype call, whatever it might be. And simply Jay has access to all of my data. If you allow your practitioner to have it, they can look at all of your leaf-based device. And then I simply um, share with Jay too what my aura ring is on a, on a nightly mm-hmm. basis. So I know it's a lot of fun. If anybody's interested in saying, how can I improve my resilience to stress? How can I improve my HRV? It's a great practice to get into. And I, I definitely recommend that. Jay, any parting words for my community where they can also find you on social media and your podcast as well? Yeah, indeed. So um, I, I appreciate you having me on. And there's a couple of places that you can find me and then I'll give one uh, parting word of wisdom, if you will. Um, so uh, Instagram, it's at Dr. J. Wiles, D-R-J-A-Y-W-I-L-E-S. Facebook, we have a Thrive Wellness and Performance Facebook site as well as Dr. J. Wiles on Facebook. And then also too, um, I co-host the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. So I'm on there with Ben for each of the Q&As. And then I also have my own podcast, Mind Hackers Radio, which you'll be on here soon. So we, we kind of trade and some podcasts here. So um, that's, you know, that's, that's where you can find me. The other thing I'll say, and the last thing that, that I'll kind of mention, and I think that you've already kind of hit on this, but I love it, is that when you do see your HRV go down, it's an opportunity for you to reframe your cognition. It's not an opportunity for you to say, well, oh, there we go. Like I'm, you know, HRV is down, so I must be stressed. Let me kind of throw everything out the window. No, utilize it for a chance to be thankful that your, yet your nervous system can provide you insight on where you are so that 
that then you can motivate, be motivated to make some changes. Or if you're an athlete, say, I'm really glad that my HRV is telling me what my nervous system is trying to tell me because now I might avoid injury or I might avoid overreaching or overtraining. So always use it as a reframe and as a motivator just to kind of get things back to your baseline or exceed that in peak performance. But don't think of it as kind of like, oh no, like I'm constantly seeing kind of like these fluctuations up and down of my HRV. I'm not getting consistency. It's just data. It's just information. It's valuable information, but in the end, it's just data. So use it wisely and use it accordingly. And I guarantee you that if you learn how to take control over your nervous system, you're going to have better sleep. You're going to have a reduction in pain. If you experience chronic pain, you're going to have better blood pressure. You're going to have, um, you know, reduced anxiety, stress, depression. These things are going to come. And I'm not saying this is a cure-all. It's not a panacea, but I do know, and the research is very clear that on the things that I just mentioned, plus more, that when you learn how to modulate and regulate your nervous system, you're not going to experience the severity, the duration, and the frequency of those things that I just mentioned. So I can drop my mic now. I'm like sitting down here in front of me. Um, but no, I appreciate you having me on, man. That was a great way to end the show. I mean, that's really what it's all about. Thank you for summing that up. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And for everybody, head over to today's podcast page. I will link up all of the devices that Jay and I recommend and so much more. Take care and I'll talk with you all soon. Before you go, I wanted to ask you this question. What if I could teach you in just a couple of hours how to transform your thyroid, hormones, adrenal, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, weight loss, energy, mood, brain, pregnancy, anti-aging, or many other health-related issues. After 20 years in private practice, after seeing and overseeing a quarter of a million client appointments, I sincerely feel I have the real-world data and have found the answer you've been searching for. So what I've done is spent hundreds of hours of my own time refining what you need to know in order to uncover your underlying root cause health issues and then begin to rebalance the body and bring it back to a state of robust health and wellness. I'm going to teach you exactly what I do in my private practice so you can understand how you got here and now what you need to do in order to heal. You'll receive all of the important success checklists, protocols, and even ways to customize it to make the program fit your busy life. And you'll get all of this at a fraction of the price. Let me save you the time, money, energy, stress, and frustration of not knowing what to do next. Instead of reading dozens of books on the topic and seeing multiple practitioners, I will condense everything that you need to know in just a few hours of video tutorials that you can watch and listen to anywhere. Together, we will make this healing process an enjoyable one that you can take with you for the rest of your life. I wish you all of the best of health and happiness, and I hope to be able to guide you on your healing journey through my health results accelerators. Simply choose the health imbalance you're currently suffering from, and by the end of today, you'll know what went wrong and how to get well again. I guarantee it. For details, head over now to stephencabral.com forward slash courses.